<coughs> okay. okay. So I can be pretty far away from this and it's still going to work just fine. That's good. Um, welcome. Thank you for uh, coming to my session and uh, giving us the gift of your uh, attention. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, website personalization, um, you know, lessons learned from uh, the field and opportunities uh, going forward. Um, uh, we're, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apologize in advance. The, um, you know, you have to submit your session outlines well in advance of actually having everything ready. I don't know if you all knew that, but it's, it's true. And I had originally planned to have this as a panel discussion with a bunch of my uh, agency partners. And then the scheduling ended up being such that the session was scheduled at the same time as the Pantheon Partner Summit. So I had to pivot a little bit in terms of how we're going to do this. So we'll have a little bit of a uh, presentation from me. Um, and then I've, I've got a special guest here, James, uh, from, uh, from Lytix. And what I'm going to try to do is go through my content um, not, I'm not going to rush through it, but I'm going to go through the content and hopefully use about half the time we have here. And that what I really want to do is get a conversation started, kind of, you know, we're not going to do it as a panel discussion, but f questions from you that myself or maybe even more likely James can answer um, as he is a, a deep expert in the field. Um, well, let's go ahead and get rolling. <clears throat> um, hi. I'm Josh. Uh, I see some familiar faces in the audience, but for those of you who I haven't met, um, I'm a co-founder uh, at Pantheon and have been doing uh, this whole thing for quite a while. <laughs> um, it's been my career uh, and my privilege to basically you know, build the web from web 1.0 days, discovered Drupal in, in an interesting and exciting fashion, got to start a cool digital agency, got to start a cool website operations platform, you know, um, that today uh, is used by tens of thousands of professional teams, powering hundreds of thousands of websites, reaching over a billion unique monthly visitors. So like, woohoo, that's kind of cool. Um, and uh, I'll just really quickly, because um, uh, I'm here representing the company to some extent, explain what Pantheon is for those of you who have not heard of it. Like you can see our big booth in there and the, and the show floor and so forth. But basically, we bring together all the things that you need to run a, a really professional grade website practice. So we run the websites, that's important, um, and we're very good at hosting websites, but you know, if we're the best in the world, which I believe, we're the best by a small margin. There's a lot of other great hosts out there. But what we do that's very different and unique is the way in which we integrate all the technologies associated with hosting and then also connect that to a workflow and a process that makes the teams that build the websites much, much more effective than they would otherwise be if they were kind of figuring it out on their own and DIYing their process. Um, and we also help teams that have not just one website, but a portfolio of sites. So digital agencies love us, but so do universities, so do large organizations that you know, have to manage a lot of stuff. We're uniquely suited to that use case. And so we love being here at DrupalCon. We were born out of this community, and it's a, a privilege to present to all of you. So the origins of this talk, um, well before I met James and we started talking about this as a, as a partnership, um, we were doing some exploratory R&D on a website that actually still exists, I just checked it, it's still up, uh, that we called p13n.me. Um, p13n is the you know, sort of shortening up of personalization the same way people do with accessibility and other stuff. So you'll see that in a couple of other places in the presentation just for brevity. Um, but p13n.me was a R&D project inside of Pantheon that I undertook with our chief technology officer and a couple other folks to say like, you know, what could we bring to the table that would be unique in this context of personalization? And in particular, because we integrate everything from the CDN to the CMS, we wanted to see if there was a way that we could allow Drupal to be in charge of managing and serving personalized content, but make it scalable by caching it in our CDN appropriately. There's a challenge with doing these things back and forth. The more you le lean on Drupal, the, the less, the, the more difficult it is to handle like a big traffic spike or a lot of people coming to visit. You don't want that. So the example we built, which was totally successful, it kind of like proved the concept of what we wanted to do technically uh, for our por portion of this was to take, we know, Umami, we know it, we love it, the Drupal demo site that gets used all the time, and it's, I'm so glad the community made this. And we loaded it up with like a little bit of custom content, and so that standard homepage splash was like a big juicy, 
you know, premium burger. But if you turn on um, your um, VPN, and I actually signed up for a VPN just to do these demos, you turn on your VPN and you change your location to Vancouver, Canada, you reload the, reload the homepage and but ow, it's poutine. Um, and, and then you can prove also that actually this is coming from the edge and like if a million people in Canada wanted to see this, it would not cause Drupal to fall over. Um, and so that's like, you know, it's a simple example, but this is the type of stuff that we're talking about being able to do that when you have these use cases, like you probably don't run a food magazine, but if you did and you had a Canadian audience, this might be a useful thing to think about doing. Um, so this part two of the origin for this was Pantheon also started to really lean into technology partnerships. Historically, um, as a platform, you know, my co-founders and I came from the, Dr the Drupal ecosystem and also the world of digital agencies. So we had a very natural affinity with the people that build websites for a living, because that used to be us. Um, and so we have a really strong and deep ecosystem of digital agency partners and a lot of people invested in making that those partnerships work. And we have a much newer, uh, and you know, in, in all honesty, much more fledgling program around partnering with technology providers. Um, so the digital agencies do the building and they help uh, uh, customers like iterate on their websites and make them better and better over time. But then there are also these other tools, like very frequently we're not just running a website as a standalone entity that just is an end all be all in, in and of itself. Like there's other stuff, there's at minimum, there's some analytics, maybe there's some CRM. Um, and as we got into uh, this P13N.me use case, we realized that going beyond the example we came up with, which we could do all ourselves because we can tell if you're coming from Canada or not, um, you know, what you want to do is you want to build and leverage profiles of data about who's visiting your website. You might have other data you can bring in, but at a minimum, you want to keep track of what people are doing with your website, what they seem to be interested in, and, uh, and then potentially leverage that and do smarter things with your, your content and your experience as a result. And, you know, that led us to the very rational conclusion that we would need to look to partner with some of these customer data platforms, that's a, 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 a category of software, that really specialize in doing this. And the, the, the Lytics is a, is a CDP, um, we'll talk a little bit more about in a second. You know, what makes a customer data platform special is it helps you aggregate data from many sources. Um, if it's a good one, it helps you build a first party data strategy so you're not relying on, you know, external stuff and data brokers and third party cookies that may or may not work next year. Um, and, uh, but, and also it enables you to operate in real time. Um, you know, CRM systems um, are also very valuable and a lot of, most big organizations have both because CRM is kind of like your canonical system of record for uh, information about customers that you're gonna have your teams interact with. So they're powering the sales process, they're powering a support process and so forth. CDPs are designed to work in real time so they can power um, digital uh, experiences or automated experiences that don't necessarily have humans involved. So, for example, a CDP is a tool that you might see used to trigger an outreach email when you reach a certain uh, uh, place in a, in a web journey or to have the right homepage uh, hero show up depending on what interest profiles uh, have been generated around you. And so we, we started exploring the world of CDPs because we could see that if we wanted to follow the path of uh, providing this interesting approach to personalization, we'd need t technology partners to bring that component. And that was how we started talking with Lytics, you know, just over a year ago. Um, and we've now are brought this kind of, you know, this partnership to its first real fruition. The other thing that I'll say about Lytics that I think is really special is in addition to being the data platform and kind of the plumbing of wiring all the data together and moving things around, they also have an amazing <clears throat> Um, engine for building these audience profiles. Because when you're thinking about delivering the right content to the right person at the right time, that's the mantra of personalization. That's why everybody wants to do it. Um, you know, very frequently you're not actually thinking, um, oh, I need to get Phil his content specifically. It's more like we've identified that Phil is, you know, one of our four, three or four major audience buckets. Um, and you're not trying to do everything right down to the micro level to make it you know, practical um, and, and maintainable, you're looking at segmenting your audience in different groups. Um, and that's an additional thing to do on top of just being the plumbing for all the data going around. You have to say, well, 
what is this data telling us? What are the trends? How do we bucket people? How do we communicate that around? So Lytx has both of those things together in one, which is really uh, powerful. A lot of the other tools in the market kind of sell those as separate things, and sometimes they actually came from separate companies originally, and they don't, they aren't, they don't fit, fit together perfectly. It's kind of annoying. Um, <clears throat> so that's what, one of the things we liked about Lytx was the fact that like, it's kind of like an all-in-one solution to get this whole use case rolling for people. What are you doing with this? Like, actually, show of hands, who here has done website personalization before? Okay, so some folks, uh, but, but that's, that, this is good. This is what I expected, like the audience to have, have people who are interested in this but haven't necessarily done it before. Um, you know, what you're doing with this is you're trying to find ways to deliver more relevant content to people um, uh, because, you know, if you have a website that gets any, even a, a modest amount of traffic, they're not all of the same type of person with the same, you know, goal in mind. You have different people coming to your website on different parts of their journey, and if you can do things like, you know, make the call to action relevant to whatever they did before, it's just statistically proven at this point. They're just much more likely to say like, oh yeah, that's what I want to do. Let's move, let's move forward. Like making it really easy for them to continue their journey or making it more compelling for them to engage. Or, you know, I do this for, for people in, in my design group. Whomst among us has tried to talk someone out of putting a slider on the homepage of their website? Right? It's like proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is a bad user experience. It doesn't work. And yet, <laughs> so many sliders. Um, and it's tough, right? I'm sympathetic too. The challenge with the slider is you do have multiple messages, you have multiple audiences, and maybe within the organization that's you know, trying to represent itself on the website, you, know, you might have multiple stakeholders. And they can't all agree, because you only have one homepage. And so you compromise by saying, well, we'll have it like flip around through these different things and hopefully the person will see the thing that was relevant. Um, but wouldn't it be better if the website was just like, oh, you're this type of person, here's the homepage hero message for you, and everybody got the message that was best to them. It's these sorts of things like, you can go, you can drive yourself insane thinking of all the different ways you could personalize a website down to the nth degree, but part of what we're trying to bring to the table is really taking a step back and like, let's just start by doing this first. Let's, let's like knock the slider off the website and, and figure out, because that means we already have however many slides worth of content. We have seven different messages we could be delivering. Let's figure out how to deliver the right message to the right audience. Um, very practical stuff, that's what we're going for. Um, and Pantheon has been, as I mentioned before, we, we did the R&D on the sort of the technical side of how could we scale it. We've been researching this as a problem area for a long time. Um, and what we've consistently found is that it's a real challenge for people. Um, you know, people are in the room because they're interested, but they haven't done it themselves yet. And the reasons, or presumably uh, it's like, quite likely the reasons that you haven't done it yet are it's expensive, it's complicated, it's hard to get started, and it's hard to operate. Um, and so the rewards of personalization are, you know, you don't know until you do it, but like, again, plenty of uh, uh, prior art exists to suggest that if you can do this successfully, it's a pretty big payoff. But the challenge, the learning curve, the risks and the costs are, are really high, and they, I think they deter most teams. In fact, like that was, a, I have a slide in there. Um, oh, it's, it's credited down at the very bottom. That, that black slide is actually an internal presentation that we did after doing <clears throat> two focus groups, one in Boston, one in San Francisco, and like, 80 one-on-one -on -one interviews with, you know, marketers in mid to large scale organizations. And like only one of the marketers in the one-on-one -on -one interviews was actually really, really doing personalization. But everybody else was like, yeah, we've, we were doing a little bit of it. We're going to try it. Or it's on the roadmap for next year. <clears throat> and we've heard that consistently over and over again. That, that is this aspirational use case, but, but that feels, uh, to, the, to the title of the talk, feels out of reach um, for a lot of teams. And um, so we're gonna change that. <clears throat> but first I wanna make sure we understand what the challenges are. So complex, right? Personalization is complex because there's so many different data sources you could be pulling from. There's so many different touch points you could be um, uh, acting on. And <clears throat> oftentimes like the, the technical complexity of this is quite daunting too because you know, you've got your CDP, you've got uh, personalization engine or profile builder, you've got your CMS, you've got your CDN, you might actually even have other components that are required. And even if 
one vendor comes to you with all these things, quite often it's not quite the it's not quite nicely integrated package that it seems, you know, when when it's when it's being demonstrated. There's just a lot of moving parts typically in, in a lot of these builds, which has meant that, you know, that complexity in itself is is daunting. It creates, you know, complex projects are, are harder to, to pull off successfully, they're harder to predict in terms of how long they'll take, and and, le and they're, they're harder to implement, leading into the next thing, which is just the cost, right? Like uh, I was talking with, um, uh, we have someone who's, uh, they, they, they were doing a, they're gonna do a demo after this uh, talk at our booth, um, and it's uh, it's sort of a blind item demo for a nonprofit, but but they were, um, they were saying, you know, they've had a customer that's wanted to do personalization forever. They've got a cl really clear use case about like, we want you know people who are just learning about us to become newsletter subscribers and we want newsletter subscribers to become donors. So it's just like getting that into the website so that we know if you're new, a subscriber or a donor, right? And just having some variations on that. And they were looking at like hundreds of thousands of dollars of just software cost. And then the people were telling them, well, you know what you should, this is pretty tricky to get working. So take the licensing fee that we're gonna charge you and like five exit and that's your implementation budget. And so they're like looking at half a million dollars, right? And then they read the fine print and it's like, that's good for 25,000 users. And it's like, ugh. Um, it's just a non-starter for a lot of folks uh, at that level. And, and <clears throat> both in terms of like the, 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 all the tools that need to be bought and, and the cost of implementation, right? So, so people, you know, they aspire to it, but again, it gets put off. Um, and then even if people do come up with the budget, um, that long implementation timeline and then some of the complexity of actually operating personalization, which we'll talk about, make it slow. It's slow to get started and oftentimes slow to build momentum if you can build it at all. I have this little cutie baby picture in here because I think a lot of the standard sales lingo around this uh, use case has been crawl, walk, run, um, which is not like a lot of things are crawl, walk, run. But I talk with people who are in this space and they're working on it and the reality is a lot more like crawl, crawl, crawl. And like, it, that's, that's not great because you spent half a million dollars, it's two years later and you're still crawling. Like who's, no, no one likes that. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think that's particularly in today's environment, like slow to show value and expensive is a very, very difficult uh, proposition for most people to stomach. People want to say, look, I want to do something. We gotta get off the mark. I'd like to innovate. We've been talking about this forever, but I need, it, I need to be able to know whether this is gonna work quickly. I'd like to be able to say, put up a win, um, get something up and running. And, th and then if it looks good, we'll invest more into it. Cause it's not like people don't have budgets. It's just that they don't wanna spend the whole budget up front on something that they're not gonna know if it worked for 18 months. That's reasonable, right? <laughs> um, and the last thing is like historically the approaches to this have just made it very hard to operate. So in addition to the general problem of there being many pieces to integrate, the predominant pattern in personalization uh, toolkits today is what a lot of people call the shadow CMS, where you have your actually existing CMS and website thing, like you've got your Drupal, and that's delivering the, the website, canonically true, and then there's an overlay, which is the personalization engine, which is fiddling with the user experience at the last minute, and dropping in different calls to action or changing things around. And, and so this creates, fundamentally creates tension and conflict over what technology is really authoring that user experience. Um, and this falls apart in a couple different ways. Um, one is, uh, just it's terrible for the content teams because now it's like I have two things that could be determining what my content is and it gets confusing. And particularly if you're trying to think about getting beyond the simplest use case of like the homepage slider or something like that, you'd wanna to start to think about having different journeys and other things. You need to manage that content, but not with your content management system. You're managing this content in this other thing. And like I've seen uh, demos where, and I'm not gonna call out other vendors, but it's um, uh, someone, a, a tool that I've used in the past that uh, it's great technology, but the way that the customer ended up operating it was, um, they, sorry, it's a similar problem with A-B testing. This was actually an A-B testing tool. But they were managing content on their homepage just by having like 35 experiments that were all dialed up to A or B completely. And that was, that was just, that was, that was where they had gotten themselves over time. And the, the divergence between the 
personalization and testing overlay and the underlying actual website had gotten so wide that they basically gave up on the underlying website, uh, which is really a shame. Um, the other problem here is that um, as a technical matter, when you're using JavaScript in the browser to do the fiddling of the bits at the last mile, um, you can run into uh, user experience problems. Right? If, if it's not done appropriately and correctly, people will see it. It kind of ruins the magic <laughs> when, when, when you get to see the sleight of hand happening. Um, and it, particularly you know, with more and more traffic happening on devices like this rather than you know, laptops that are connected to fiber-powered Wi-Fi, it's not just like you might see a flicker, it's like the page might hang for a while. And mobile uh, uh, users, people on the other end of mobile browsing devices, they don't tolerate, they'll just swipe away. They don't, they're not gonna wait and see what it was. Oh, the, you know, it's just like if you try to read a news article and like the adware is so bad that you can't read it. Like you don't, you're just like, okay, well I'm not gonna like look at that source again because I know it's a bad experience. Um, and, it, and it's hard to operate you know, uh, uh, for, for the web teams as well. If you're doing anything more sophisticated than just like saying, you know, changing the, call, the words in a button or the headline on an article, you, you, you know, you, you're, their cool WYSIWYG editor is actually not gonna get you there uh, because to really change the layout or really change like a, 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 a full element on the page, you're gonna end up going in and writing custom code in JavaScript in that tool. And it just like the complexity, of the P you can do that if you've got really good people that know how to run that type of operation. You can hire experts who just do that for a living and they can make it work well. But if you're doing it you know, without that kind of expertise, again, that's another cost, um, it just gets challenging. Um, and, and the risk that you end up blowing the user experience and having a negative impact versus a positive one you were looking for is high. So, just to recap, gosh, you, you haven't done personalization yet, but you're here to find out about it. So, um, it's entirely possible to spend a ton of money and time uh, and see very little return on it, if not, in fact, having a negative return from attempting to do personalization. So, that's the end of my talk. We can all go home now. This use case is dead. Just forget about it. <laughs> um, no, but, and yet, the, the potential for this remains, because when it's done right, when it's done appropriately, it is undeniably effective, and it, it makes sense, right? It's, we're all on the other side, we're all users of the web too, we know, right? And, and again, I mean done right and done responsibly. So let's talk about how we can do that. Oh, sorry, this is the, uh, yes, the, that was the, uh, the takeaway from our research team. Um, Here's what we're trying to do. James and I are here representing our companies and we're, we're all around DrupalCon, so people want to talk more about this uh, after the session. We have Q&A here, but we can go, we're, we're ready to go as far as any of you want to go while we're here in Portland. We're going to try to give you, bring you the promise of personalization without this heavy lift. That is our, our, our call to action uh, for the, the, the conference. Um, and what we're really trying to do is put together a pathway for people to get their website, to get the first piece up and running, delivering value, helping people do good in 30 days. Um, 30 days could be aspirational because sometimes you got to do a little thinking and talking and, you know, but from like, from like, from, from a kickoff meeting, um, 30 days. And we're doing that by bringing, you know, thank you, James, a free uh, tool for CDP and the personalization engine, and it's not a it's not a it's not a trick. It's not the nerfed version that only works for two weeks or for ten users. It's good. It's the tools you need to do these basic use cases that we talked about for up to five million monthly impressions at no cost. And then when you reach, you know, you need some of the extra tools or you've got volume, the cost is not going to be exorbitant. It's going to be like five hundred bucks a month. It's like not. It's it's we're trying to democratize uh, access uh, to this tool set. Um, and we are <clears throat> working on a open source implementation layer for Drupal, um, and we'll have one for WordPress as well, but for Drupal, we've started with that with the modules, so that the, the, the fundamental basics of getting this up and running aren't something that you're having to reinvent. Like, we'll be pulling in audience data to Drupal. We'll be uh, integrating that with popular editing tools. Um, we're leveraging um, 
uh, our, our agency partner, Elevated Third, great agency, they built a whole suite called Smart Content, which gives you a way of saying like, here's an audience, now I can vary the content based on the audience. Linux plugs right into that. Pantheon plugs right into that with our CDN. Like that is, it's not, it's not, it's not totally done yet, but that's coming along and for people who wanna get their hands dirty, like again, you can get a free Linux account, you can get the module, um, and if you wanna get involved now, we're happy to talk you through sort of what goes on uh, with the implementation, where there is still work to be done, and, and we're hoping to build more of an open source effort around that, because we should all share that together. Um, there's nothing specific to any one particular website of how do you fit the Legos together. The specific stuff is, what's your content, what's your design, who are your audiences? Like that's where we want people, you know, if we can get a, get a process where you do your kickoff, and then a day later you're into those questions. What, what content, where, for whom, that's how you can get something up and running uh, in 30 days. And again, we're targeting these use cases. We've got a, building a library of inspiration, these very straightforward things like homepage slider, different calls to action. Um, we, another thing we did in the, in the P13N uh, demo was like with Umami was demonstrated, you could have a paywall if you wanna have subscriber content. Like, like that shouldn't be really hard to do, the, getting those things set up. So there's like straightforward fundamental use cases. Um, and we're also backing that with playbooks. So, you know, how to, how to socialize this with your teams, how to pitch this to people to get them on board, what to do if people, you know, are interested in this, how, what questions to ask, you know, a worksheet to go through to identify this, a, a, an example project plan of what those first 30 days could maybe look like. It's not gonna be, you know, Perf right for everyone, but it gets 80% of the way there for how you would actually, the human side of trying to take this forward. Because even with all the technology being as, as, you know, as good as it is, even if it, as it gets better, which it will, it's still not gonna be something that you can just like, you know, push a button and, and make happen. We can get the pieces, uh, the technical bits, pretty much set up uh, with, with very little uh, beyond put the push of a button. But the questions that are gonna be human are gonna remain. Again, what's your content? Where is it showing up? Who's gonna care? Analytics has some really um, amazing tools that work out of the box to give you a sense of user behavior, who's already out there, what are they doing on your website. They'll also spider all your content and run it through a whole bunch of uh, you know, sentiment analysis and content analysis and, and other things. You know, it's not gonna do your content strategy for you because again, that only you can do, but it'll give you a decent place to start. Like, and then you can start to overlay these things. Who's browsing my website? What do they appear to be interested in? There's audiences that I already kind of knew about, but then there's maybe some that are, I'm just seeing now in the data. Pick one and then boom, get something going for them. You can do that in a couple of sprints, in a couple of weeks, in 30 days or less. That's the idea. Um, and we wanna be able to do this in a way that lets people have high performance websites even when they're doing the personalization inside of Drupal. Um, and this, this gets a little bit technical, but I, I want, I'll, I'll walk through it. This was the, this is the interaction model for how the Umami demo uh, uh, sort of works, where it's like the first request comes in, we know that it's from Canada, we've got a, a, a variant in our cache for, for Canada, so basically there's a separate cache for Canadian users, that's a common pattern, and it's like, poutine! Um, and then in the full demo, it's like, oh, it's vegan poutine, and the user gets really interested in that because they happen to be vegan. They click through to a couple more vegan recipes, and then the, the personalization engine has noticed that and said, well, they seem to really be locking in on that vegan content. Let's put them in the vegan audience. And they go back to another landing page, and now the vegan brownies are you know, the featured dessert. Right? And so they're like, oh, vegan brownies, I, I have to, I'm, I'm hosting a dinner party, now it's time for me to do that. They, they click on the vegan brownies and the, um, the, the personalization engine, which has a, you know, another branch in the logic says, well, you've just consumed your fourth free recipe, uh, it's time to drop the paywall. So there's a variation of the page that you know, has half the rest. You know, you, we've all had this experience where the New York Times does this to us or whatever. Um, you know, the, the half the ingredients are there, but you've got to subscribe. And then you can have the, the, the whole interchange where they go through and they log in and subscribe. That Drupal handles, right? That's a, that's a submission to the CMS. There's probably, you know, if you wanted to have payment logic in there, that'd be a complex process. But then once you're done, you're actually back into being like hyper scalable because now you just have the subscriber content. Cause it's like, it's not, it, again, we're not talking about being specific to that user. It's just for the people who have subscribed. That's, one, that's just another audience. And you can have that delivered, you know, if you have uh, uh, an event happen and there's, you know, tens of thousands or millions of subscribers are coming back to the website, you wanna be able to handle that. And, and with this model, setting things up this way, you can absolutely do that. Um, 
The other thing that we can do is handle, to help people handle this at scale when it's not just a eh website that they're trying to do this across, it's, it's a portfolio of sites. Uh, like I said at the beginning, this is one of the things that Pantheon does very differently than anyone else. It's totally different than industry standard. It's what we've built our differentiation on with our core technology and we make it viable for people to run like a thousand Drupal sites. We have customers that are doing that today and they're happy. Uh, it's amazing, but it's true. And so um, with that same capability, we can say like, look, if you wanted to de deploy Linux across your site portfolio and start gathering signals from all these different pl places, it's, uh, it's very straightforward to do so. So lots of excitement, lots of potential in the, in the future there, but uh, just to kind of talk a little about what makes the partnership different and special. The last thing I want to say is that um, the ethos of this for both ourselves and for, for Linux is to approach this responsibly. Um, people have a lot of concerns around privacy. Um, studies have shown that obviously when personalization is done right and done responsibly, it is effective. But if it's done wrong or done irresponsibly, it is creepy. So we want to make sure that we are keeping people on the path of you're earning the right to know your customer. Although I like to talk about it like, you know, if I go to the coffee shop in my town center and they say, hey, Josh, good to see you. Like that's a warm feeling, I like that because they've earned the right to know my name and we've had a bunch of interactions and, and there's, a, there's a good feeling there. If it's like, you know, you, you're showing up at like, um, you know, Target and like something scans your face and it's like, Mr. Koenig, we have a special offer for you. Right, that doesn't feel good, that feels dystopian and wrong. Uh, and so like, it, you know, some of this is about just like making sure that the tech is set up correctly so that we're not leaking data and we're doing the right things for being privacy forward in the future and, you know, cookies are going to, third party cookies are going to die, privacy sandboxes and anything, that, that's part of what we're doing. But also it's like setting it up so people are taking the right approach, taking the right path um, and personalizing responsibly. Um, we just announced this, I'm here, I'm happy to be here talking about it with James. We just publicly announced this like less than a month ago at, uh, at Google Next and so it's still early days for us. We're, we're really eager to engage with people, hear what questions they have, hear what early use cases we could, we could bring into the partnership and bring along. Um, and we're going to be after this, going to do a deep dive over in like a, one of Pantheon's rooms down by the Boff area. So if anybody wants to actually talk through a project, not in a big room, but like around a table, you're welcome to follow us over there. there. But with that, I will stop monologuing and ask what questions people have. Thank you. Yes. So is all of this uh, session based? So is it a single session from a data standpoint? So the, the question is, is all of this session based um, in a single session from a data standpoint? And I think I might, we might have to ask, I might have to ask a follow up question as to in, Say more about what you mean by session, because that could mean a couple different things. Like a, uh, well, I guess from a cookie standpoint, expiration. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, uh, is all of this happening within the, the lifetime of a single co cookie, of a single cookie session? No, so we, we're a data platform. We do construct, here, I'll just like, just that way I have more effect. Yeah, so we build a persistent profile over time. So uh, now we know cookies obviously are, they have shorter and shorter lifespans, but essentially we kind of connect data from one session to the next session. So you'd be able to identify somebody that visited the website and then the next day came back and was looking at different content or new content. So you'd be able to recognize that return visitor. And then if they signed up for the newsletter and said, hey, email me more recipes, uh, vegan recipes, we would then be able to connect that email address with those cookie IDs. So a, a core part of the platform is identity, which is a really hard problem to solve. We've been working on it for the last 10 years. Um, we built this identity graph for you and your, your, your account, your, you know, your brand. Um, and so it's all first party data. We do connect um, these, you know, as we kind of stop there, it's like a data hub. Um, and so we can connect data across those different identity uh, fragments and stitch that all together. We can do personal, so the, the other piece of that is it's all happening in real time. So it's a kind of a real time streaming architecture where we are continuously updating that profile even within session. So somebody moves from, you know, they were 
they just happen to land on the, uh, they're from Canada and they're like, oh, vegan, poutine, I don't want that. Uh, then they go to the next, whatever the next recipe is. We're continuing we, to update the profile and we have all that context available to the website in real time. Yeah, absolutely. So we work with hundreds of enterprise customers, global, you know, companies that are doing business uh, in Europe, um, in Germany. Uh, a couple of things, and I'm, this is something that I kind of geek out on because I'm a former attorney uh, and was a chief privacy officer. So this is something that's really important. I think like we're all trying to figure out how do we help companies navigate all of the new regulatory environment and all the changes that are happening with the browsers and everything else. And so, um, you know, we all say, oh, you need a first party data strategy. And everybody's like, yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, I, I got to get one of those. <laughs> where, do, where do I sign up? I think that there's, there's a booth. It's, it's called first party data strategy and I sign up for it. Um, and all that really means is, you know, what Josh is saying is you're trying to build this consent based relationship with your prospects and customers. And so we're a tool that helps you do that. So collect that data, recognize consent. So we integrate with all the consent tools like InfoTrust and others. Um, so you can you know, make sure that you're complying with the cookie consent. But also there's other consent requirements that happen in G you know, as it relates to GDPR and CCPA in California and there are other regulations elsewhere. And so can you A, you know, provide uh, access to all of the profile data. If somebody files a subject access request, like, hey, I want to know what data you're collecting on me and I want to be able to provide that. Yes, we can support that. I want to know if, what privacy policy did I consent under? Have you tracked that? Do you have that available in my profile? Yes, we have that. And so I think, you know, part of this is, this is actually a privacy tool um, to help you build this first party relationship. Why that becomes important is because now I can start to not be creepy, but I can kind of start to acknowledge you and welcome you and, you know, start to build that relationship. And I can use that information, you know, for kind of consent-based targeting. And so it's getting harder and harder in the ad ecosystem, uh, you know, with all of the changes that are happening in these walled gardens. And so you need to build your own data set to support that. What other questions do people have? Oh, in the back. Yeah, I mean, the, the personal in, personalization initiative is something that I think everybody is scared of, <laughs> is worried about, is, you know, has a, has a lot of deep-seated questions, you know, can I make this work? And so we kind of at Lytix, we're a data platform, but our core belief is at the end, this data is really to kind of serve your, your end customer. And so in order to do that, you really need to be able to understand who they are, what they care about, and then be able to take that, those insights or that information and make it available um, back to the website and to your email system and to ad campaigns. And so um, from the very beginning, we, we identified that there was this huge gap, which is we might be able to collect some information on, on somebody from the website, but in order to do personalization, I need to know that they are looking at vegan content, that they're interested in, you know, the casserole. Um, and so we built not just a user graph where we're collecting and building up that profile with all that data, but this content graph. And so we use 
Google NLP and computer vision to basically analyze all the text and the images and the videos on your website. And then we build this content graph and it's the relationship between the user and the content that enables you to make these kind of decisions that now I know what this user is interested in and I can make the right recommendations. I don't have to kind of make a guess. And so that connection between the user and the content, what we could describe as the decision, right? Who gets what content? What, how do I deliver the right content to the right person at the right time? We've done that mapping. That mapping is really, really hard. I mean, that's the part that everybody kind of, is my taxonomy up to date? Do I have all those tags? Am I able to add all those tags to the user profile? I'm using Google Analytics. I don't think I can do that. So I think, you know, we wanted to build a toolkit that out of the box, it just worked. I didn't have to go and do 200 hours of kind of updating my taxonomy. I didn't have to do another 50 hours of connecting data and building an identity model and making my profile available in real time to the browser and all these other tools. We have all those tools, they're all built, they're all available in the, the toolkit, like out of the box. And I think, you know, when we think about personalization, we think about, hi, Josh. But so much of it is, you know, do they really know that I'm there for my triple shot latte or my matcha or whatever it is? And so the context is incredibly important. And we do that by helping to understand not just the user, but all of your content as well. The last thing I would say is, Josh was telling that story about the shadow uh, IT kind of, uh, anyway, I was just thinking, I remember I was, I got Optimizely and I got infatuated with testing. I became that person that was doing all of those different variations and my content team, my marketing team came to me and they're like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> um, so I think people wanna, you know, inherently we wanna test and we wanna try these things and one of the things that Pantheon pushed us on as part of this partnership was it has to be integrated into Drupal and WordPress, but Drupal, it, it has to be part of the workflow and it has to be available, not sort of only as this like overlay capability. And so the simplicity of it is you're in your workflow, the data is there, it's available to you with all of the context that you need to make those decisions. Um, so, and Josh is right. We work with hundreds of companies, they run tests, this works. It's gonna increase engagement, it increases conversions, you can reduce your return on, you know, you can increase your return on ad spend because you're just being more kind of thoughtful and targeted with how you're communicating to your prospects and customers. Yeah, again. Could you repeat that? Uh, we, we have customer data that we get uh, through Embronics. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like a third party data set with attributes. Yeah, so it, inside of Lytics, so this, the personalization engine has a set of capabilities. Basically, we're kind of an enterprise CDP, which is a data platform. And what we've done is we've said, hey, let's make those features available for everyone to be able to deliver use case number one, which is personalization on the website period. In addition to that, obviously, once you get started there, there's a whole road of data. You know, one of the things we can include is you can build a big query warehouse, you can start to do, you know, machine learning modeling and, and lots of capabilities. But we also enable you to be able to kind of enrich the data with other data sources. So we have a bunch of pre-built integrations with things like LiveRamp which has access to 800 or 900 different kind of uh, data providers. But absolutely, a lot of our customers um, are looking to kind of enrich their data, add demographic information or other attributes, and that's, that's, uh, that's easily accomplished in the tool. I should say, in, on the data side, like as a data hub, we have about 400 kind of pre-built connectors, everything from Salesforce to you know, Adobe to Braze to MailChimp to, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of tools and, and channels and 
We also integrate, obviously, so those are like sources, and then there's like destinations. You can sync data to Google Ads and Meta and, you know, DB360 and Trade Desk and Yahoo and LinkedIn and Pinterest and Snap and on and on. So a lot of the lift, because I think a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to ETL data or connect data. And so we've done a lot of work to just reduce that load. Yep. I have a question on uh, tag management. Uh, I'm referring to Monster Tag like Google Tag Manager. Does Lyft have its own tag manager or can you build uh, Google Tag Manager? Like yeah, we, we integrate out of the box with Google Tag Manager. So you can implement Lytics directly through, through GTM. Yep. Or Telium or... Yeah, what, probably our number one integration is with Salesforce. So we, we do work with a, a lot of companies that are using Salesforce, Salesforce CRM and Salesforce Marketing Cloud, Salesforce Commerce Cloud and Salesforce Service Cloud. So um, what they typically do is they, they basically think of Salesforce either as like a data source. So if it's Salesforce CRM, this is all the information I have on my customers. Um, if it's Salesforce Marketing Cloud, it's like a destination. It's a place where I want to trigger emails to. And Lytics is sort of in the middle there where we provide a more comprehensive kind of customer 360. So it's like Salesforce data plus all of our real-time web data plus our mobile app data plus our enrichment from our third-party data providers plus, plus. And most of our customers use us essentially as a central kind of audience and triggering tool. So they would then build these kind of audiences inside of Lytics, and then they would be able to trigger those to Salesforce, to Google Ads, to Meta, to, you know, so you kind of create essentially a centralized record that has more context, and then you're able to coordinate those triggers out to more than just Salesforce, but sort of any, any channel or um, tool. Yeah, and, and one, uh, again, I don't know if this is exactly right for your use case, but a really straightforward example would be, you know, let's pay special attention to if these people are in one of your campaigns, and if so, that's their audience, and if they hit the homepage, guess what's above the fold instead of a slider? It's the message for that campaign. <laughs> Uh, it's like it's a, it's really about being able to just like tie together the the information you have, especially because if they're in your CRM, you already know who they are. You you've like are you're you're you're, you're getting into it, uh, into it with them. So um, yeah, and you whether you know you you can push that out to an ad platform, but you can also push that out to your website. So your website is now being responsive to this campaign activity. And I've seen people do this. <clears throat> Um, you know, it's, it's, it, this is like not something you might get up and running in 30 days because it's fairly sophisticated, but like if you're disciplined about how you use campaigns, that can drive audiences, that can drive ad placements, that can drive programmatically generated landing pages, um, and that can drive, you know, sort of essentially the automation of a lot of like web experience management out of this stuff, where again, you get to a place where your website can have 10 different faces or 10,000 different faces if you want to manage it at that kind of scale because you're not having to do it one by one manually. Yeah, I mean, and, and with Salesforce too, you have the limitation. It's like these, that information is not updating in real time. It's not updating in that session. You may not have all that interest level, you know, kind of content affinity level data. So for the web, you know, we provide that real-time view of your customers and prospects that you can use, and Salesforce just doesn't provide that, especially on the on the on the CRM side. And so, um, really, um, not that much overlap. I think people are like, "Oh, is there overlap?" And it's like, I, I don't think there is. There's a lot of opportunity, and we're obviously a lot less expensive. All right, we got time for probably one more question before we got to clear the room, if there is one. Yes. Yeah, I think, um, you know, number one, we, we've been in the enterprise, I think a lot of companies are looking at Adobe and Salesforce. So, um, 
you know, they're, they're spending a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of cycles to try to figure out, is Adobe or Salesforce, are those the right CDPs for us to manage all this data? And I, I can tell you emphatically the answer is no. That's just like a road to nowhere. Way too expensive, way too hard. Too, and so I think what we see, the pushback is more political. Oh, we're, we're a Salesforce shop, so, you know, we're not going to use that kind of tool. Um, I think the other thing is, is one of the things I love about this offering that we're doing with Pantheon exclusively is it makes this doable in 30 days. The biggest problem with CDP and, and data platforms in general is I've got to invest a year and a bunch of people and a whole lot of time for me to see results and go back into my organization and say, look, we were successful. And I think most people and companies really struggle with that timeline. So, you know, the, the, the reality is, is that there's a lot of politics around kind of data inside of your organization, I'm sure. But if you come in with a personalization use case and say, I'm going to bring you value today, and you're not, this is not a CDP. That's the other thing. I mean, I think there's a lot of kind of friction just around that term customer data platform. So I would say personalization engine, we're going to bring this real-time profile and deliver experiences that are exceptional. And then you can talk about how you want to leverage that data, you know, have other people come to you and go, I really like what you're doing on the web. Can, can we do that somewhere else? Like that's, I think that would be the right approach. Yeah, and, I, and the last thing I'd say, just to echo <clears throat> that, that comment from before, the other thing that where there's pushback is people get potentially excited about the, 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 the concept in abstract, but then they're like, in, pr in, in particular, how will we do this? What will we personalize first and for whom? And so both in terms of how we're presenting this with like some playbooks and inspiration, but also the way the technology works, if you can get, you can get agreement to just like, let's turn Linux on and see what it could tell us, there might be in that, you know, in that interest graph and that behavior graph and that content graph, like that analysis can sometimes give you the, the, the light bulb moment of like, obviously we should, you know, th here are, maybe it's not your homepage, maybe it's your third highest, most trafficked page, but there's three different types of audiences are like going there a lot and it could be better for them. So, so again, getting to those, that practical, what's the first thing we want to try? Um, Cause I think people who, with experience in this, they're, they're familiar with the, you know, the, the shiny object that in, in theory sounds great and it's gonna unlock all the things and they know to ask difficult and, and appropriately difficult questions. Well, what are you gonna do? Which part is gonna get personalized? How will it get, what data will we use? And, and Linux, you know, the kind of the out of the box uh, piece you get from just turning it on is immediately you can bring some data to bear to answer those questions. All right, you people gotta go, we gotta clear the room. Thank you all so much. Uh, we're gonna be going over to do a deep dive over there and, uh, and or find us more if you wanna talk about it later. Sorry, I shouldn't have talked over the applause.